Ayahuasca is powerful medicine, but it's much more powerful when it's used correctly with its admixture and ally plants such as Bovensana, Unirigato, Ajo Sacha, and others. And in this video, I'm going to show you step by step how to use those uh, to empower your medicine to heal all sorts of physical, mental, emotional, psychological, and spiritual problems. Uh, and stay till the end because I'm going to go through the process of actually cooking the medicine step by step. There are a number of reasons that shamans might use admixture plants from healing physical problems up to and including cancer, uh, usually more along the lines of chronic inflammation, stomach disorders, asthma even. Um, but there are also psychological, emotional, and energetic reasons to add admixture plants. And the dosage is of course really important. Uh, the constitution of the individual is important. It's also worth considering that even if you're not participating in an exclusive dieta with Bobinsana or Uña de Gato or one of these other plants, um, the relationship between the plant and your body is very complex. So part of the reason for the dieta is that when you eat certain foods, certain enzymes are created, there's all sorts of chemical reactions that happen in your body. And then when you introduce these plant-based compounds, you have a whole nother set of interactions that occur. And so it's worthy of considering that if you know you're going to be drinking ayahuasca uh, with one of these admixture plants, you should prepare accordingly. Having said that, uh, it's my opinion and the opinion of a lot of other people that combining the plants with ayahuasca can make it less necessary to have as long or as strict of a preparation because ayahuasca has the ability to catalyze the effects of these other plants. And there are different ways to think about that, that it's an enzymatic thing. Um, but in a shamanic sense, it's about opening up the energetic body, the ayahuasca allowing a dialogue to be created between the essence or the spirit of whatever healing plant you've combined with the ayahuasca so that the work that may have taken weeks or months to occur can be done very, very quickly. But in a lot of cases, people have lives that they have to get back to and they may not be able to afford a lengthy dieta, they may not have time for it. And so catalyzing uh, the efficacy of these plants um, with ayahuasca may be the best option for those people. Um, so let's talk a little bit about the plants. One of the most common and the most important admixture plants and just general uh, medicinal plants in the Amazon is a vine uh, called uña de gato, also known as cat's claw in English. Um, in order to prepare it, you basically just take these little strips um, from the vine and then you crack them until they separate and then peel these pieces so that the water can permeate more easily. And once you've broken them down um, to their smallest segments, you can place them in your pan. And although this plant has pretty low toxicity, some people say that you shouldn't work with it for an extended period of time without breaks. So if you're gonna take it on its own, uh, seven days on, seven days off should be fine. Uh, and then as far as dosage goes with ayahuasca, you might use, um, you know, if you purchase it here, they always come in these strips. I've seen them sold online the same way. Uh, you might put four or five of them in a liter. The dosage isn't that precise, um, but you know, five sticks per liter of water should be, should be fine. And the way that shamans talk about this plant is that it is like letting a jaguar loose in the blood and it hooks its claws into whatever doesn't belong um, in your body and drags it out. And the ayahuasca facilitates its ability to do that and to open a line of communication with the person that consumes it. Uh, and it has been studied extensively in the laboratory and it is anti-tumor, uh, anti-fungal, antibacterial, uh, anti-inflammatory, very effectively anti-inflammatory, antiseptic. Uh, it's an extremely useful, one of the best medicines in the jungle. In fact, the list is really long of tested, you know, clinically tested applications for this plant. And by the way, I'm going to include a blog with this video. If you want to go more into depth um, and see the full list of applications to these plants, do check out my blog as well. Bovensana. This one is basically my ally plant. This is the most important plant that I put in my teas and all of my medicines. You notice the elasticity of the branches. Um, this is the way that the plants communicate with the shamans 
by the way. Um, often there are visual cues that tell us what plant to treat snake bite with, or uh, in this case, to restore elasticity to the mind, enhance the memory, but most importantly, probably to open the heart and restore emotional balance and emotional receptivity. Uh, this is probably the main application of this plant. Uh, it's also used uh, to help aid the shaman in receiving medicine songs. In addition, it's used as an aphrodisiac and conveniently as a contraceptive. Uh, it does contain harmala alkaloids that are similar to the ones that are found in ayahuasca, but in very low concentrations, so it's not really psychoactive. Uh, but it's also very mild, and usually what is done is the bark is stripped off, and you'll want to fill your pot about 75% of the way with bark packed down in there tightly and then fill to the top and then boil that for three hours, drain it into another pot and repeat that three times and then condense until you have a paste that looks something like this. And then just add about two teaspoons per liter and you are good to go. This plant, Cherix Nanga, is a Solanaceae plant and contains tropane alkaloids. So now we're getting into potentially dangerous territory. If you were to use too much of the bark or the root, if you use only leaves and flowers, um, it's gonna be pretty difficult to reach a toxic level. You would basically have to cook pots of it and concentrate it and drink that, and then maybe you could get into trouble. So it's actually pretty safe. And the reason it is so important is twofold. Um, it gives a bit of a window into that Solanaceae spirit world. It can uh, impart a little bit more clarity and definition to the visions. Probably most importantly, it is a very strong immune system booster. It's used traditionally for STDs and common colds and headaches. Um, but, in, you know, the tradition that I learned was basically the Schwar way. Uh, and this is one of the really important components uh, but you'll just want to use maybe a dozen leaves per person or a dozen leaves per liter uh, when you're boiling and it will add an important medicinal quality to your ayahuasca. This thing is wild ginger. Water from it smells amazing and if you're ever lost in the jungle and you need clean water, you can just drain some out of here and drink it and it's ginger flavored. Good survival tactic to know. These things are loaded with water, smell like ginger, make amazing shampoo. Um, but this plant is Ajo Sacha, also called Ajo de Monte. Uh, it's a tall vine um, and one of the most important medicinal plants in the jungle. It's used uh, for pain relief, inflammation, uh, even to cure epilepsy. In fact, I had an epileptic client that came here and within one day of drinking this tea, uh, of course, there are other components, psilocybin, ayahuasca, all of these other plants, but within one day of, of commencing his treatment with this tea, he didn't have a seizure, and to my knowledge, still hasn't had a seizure since then, uh, and he was having like two major seizures a day. Even with the medication, um, which he stopped, which he started when he started drinking the teas, which should have actually caused more seizures than normal, that's the withdrawal effect. So. It does seem that this is an incredibly effective plant. Uh, and in the spiritual sense or for dieta, um, the root is dug up and shaved into water and then uh, boiled down and concentrated. And this is drank every day at 6 a.m. for three days. And then you're also bathing in the plant, which is a little bit um, stinky because it actually smells just like garlic. It's the same terpene that is in um, clove or is that what it's called clove garlic bulb garlic bulb yeah yeah so i generally don't actually cook ayahuasca with this plant because i feel like ayahuasca already tastes bad enough but a lot of people do and it is believed to ward off evil spirits and basically to give the entire being a cleanse physically spiritually psychologically i find it interesting that in eastern european folk medicine garlic is used to ward off vampires uh and evil spirits and in here in south america uh, this plant that smells exactly like garlic is used for the same purposes. So a lot of retreats will give people the bath in the beginning and uh, you'll consume a good bit of the plant every day in order to maintain a protective barrier uh, between yourself and negative influences during the retreat. And now for the most controversial ingredient of all, uh, mapacho tobacco. Um, the shawar always cook with a very small amount of mapacho in the ayahuasca. 
And there are a number of reasons for this. Uh, it is to repel both physical and energetic parasites, to kill them in your uh, digestive tract, and also to rid you of them um, in the energetic sense. It also focuses the mind and empowers prayer uh, so that the visions are much more coherent and meaningful. Uh, it can also bring focus just in your um, general conscious awareness. Uh, of course, it is something to be extremely careful with. I wouldn't necessarily recommend um, this practice for a novice, especially because in most ceremonies, you're going to be taking a, a mapacho tea through the nose. Um, and in my ceremonies, if anyone becomes overwhelmed or confused, starts to lose their connection and their focus with reality, um, they'll get a little bit of the tea in the nose and it snaps your mind into focus and can also encourage purging. But when I prepare ayahuasca, I do add a very small amount of tobacco leaf um, per liter. And last but not least, guayusa. Here in Ecuador, this is one of the most important plants in the Amazon. Um, it aids in lucid dreaming. It provides some caffeine and energy. Uh, it serves basically the same purpose in the ayahuasca as tobacco um, without the toxicity uh, because it lends the same lucidity enhancing quality that it does to your dreams uh, to the ayahuasca experience. So um, the Quechua always add guayusa to the ayahuasca. You can, you can find these strings, um, links to buy them in the WordPress blog in the description. And I would use about six of these folded leaf segments uh, per liter. Now we're getting to the actual preparation of the main body of the medicine. Uh, in general, your admixture plants are only gonna take up about 10 to 20% of the volume of your pot. So you can look at that as your leeway um, for customizing your ayahuasca with different plants, depending on what your objectives are. Uh, but of course, you're gonna need some kind of DMT containing plant. So what I have here is two, um, Amiruka um, and Diploptish Cabrarena, uh, Chaliponga. Um, a lot of people say Chaliponga is the Ecuadorian Chacruna, but that's not actually true. The Ecuadorian Chacruna is Amiruka. Uh, it's in the same family, Psychotrius Carthenogenensis, 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 <laughs> Psychotria Carthenogenensis, uh, and Chaliponga is Diplopterus Cabrarena. You're going to want to fill about 50% of your the volume of your pot with the DMT admixture plants, and then the rest is going to be ayahuasca. I've done this so many times that I don't really measure anything anymore. I just kind of like look at the volume, overall volume and guesstimate it because the potency of none of these plants is so powerful that a small deviation is gonna make any difference. Uh, and then the processing of the ayahuasca is pretty simple. We're going full traditional here with this Swazikospi base and a rock. You can use pretty much anything if it's fresh, it mashes pretty quickly. And when you start to break it up, you'll see that it's, it's basically made of little ropes and threads. Um, and you just want to open those up so that the water is able to flow through and pull all the harmalas out. Some people remove the bark, but others do not. I don't know why people do that. So I usually bend them a little bit to make sure there's plenty of availability for the water to permeate. And again, we're gonna fill about 50-50 with um, Samiruka, Chaliponga, and Ayahuasca, minus of course the admixture space. As I mentioned elsewhere in this video, I eyeball everything at this point, having cooked ayahuasca, you know, 1500 times or something. Um, but for those who would like to have a protocol to follow, uh, it can never be specific because every batch of Chaliponga or Chacruna is gonna be different. Uh, vine segments have different concentrations of harmalas depending on the age where they're cut in the vine. So it's really, really difficult to get the doses precise. But uh, in the tradition that I was taught, it's about 100 grams of vine per person and maybe 13 grams or so of chaliponga, which is very, very strong. Uh, you can actually get away with as little as 30 grams of dried um, vine and 50 grams of chacruna, 
or six to 10 grams of chalipanga. And then for every 100 grams of vine, use about a liter of water. And then you're gonna reduce all that, say five liters will become as little as half a liter. It really depends on uh, how much you wanna end up drinking. Um, and I'll show you guys the viscosity that you're looking for roughly. So now we're going to boil this full pot for three hours and then we're going to drain this pot into this pot and start reducing. And then we're going to fill this pot up again, boil for another three hours, pour it into the reduce, keep going. We're going to do that three times and if it's really dark you can do it a fourth time to make sure you extract all the alkaloids. Basically if the water becomes clear you can stop and if it's still very dark then you keep going. And then we're going to reduce it down to the viscosity that I'll show you in the next scene. Once you've fully reduced the medicine, it's gonna be pretty thick. You can see it has kind of almost a uh, smoothie consistency. Um, and again, you know, you just can't really be too highly specific about this. You just kind of have to um, get it in this ballpark and then try it. And if you follow the outline that I provided in this video, if you drink an ounce or two to test it, uh, worst case scenario, you're going to have to drink a second cup. It's not going to come out so overwhelmingly strong that it's going to be dangerous. So it is a little bit loose and there's really no way to predict the potency of the plants that you're using, but the guidelines provided in this video will keep you in the safe zone. It's a common practice to either use soap blades, the blowing of mapacho tobacco smoke with uh, whistling, which is actually the original meaning of Ikaro. It's a Quechua word that means healing through smoke. Uh, it didn't actually originally apply to ayahuasca songs. Uh, but you can use Icaros for the admixture plant that you want to predominate in the mixture. So for example, uh, if you are using Bogansana and you want that influence to be very powerful, then you would sing um, the Icaro Sirenita um, for the Little Mermaid, and that will empower the Bogansana to uh, have a predominant influence in the medicine. Likewise, if you want to use Guayusa, use a Guayusa Icaro and Uña de Gato, use an Uña de Gato Icaro and so forth. Medicina, then.